Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Gospel Life Church. We are so glad that you're here with us this morning. Why don't we stand as we worship God together this morning? Let's put our hands together. So turn to somebody next to you, say good morning, happy Sunday, glad you're here. As we continue, we're going to continue singing. You can stand up. We're going to sing a song that we taught last week. Um, it just talks about how we've seen God's faithfulness. And so therefore, we believe that he will continue to be faithful. So let's sing this together. You're worthy of all of this. 
you're constant, I'm wasted, and I'm confident, I'll see it again and again, you love and I'm witnessed it, you heal and I've witnessed it, you save and I'm witnessed it, and I'm confident, I'll see it again and again. for the reminder over and over again from your word, from our stories, from our life, from the people gathered in this room, of your faithfulness to us, your faithfulness, Lord, to others, and just how much you care for us. Lord, we are thankful. And so, Lord, today I pray you fix our eyes and our hearts upon you. We see all that you have done and all that you are doing will be for our good and for your glory. Even in the toughest times, even in the valley lows, on the mountaintop as well, Lord, may we see and be reminded of your faithfulness and your love to us. And may we share that with others. I pray that in Jesus' holy name, amen. Amen. You may be seated. Good morning. I, I want to share with you a couple things before we move on in the service, and I'm ha have Pastor Scott come up and uh, join us in prayer. Uh, this is the hard part of pastoring, uh, of what you experience with people who become in your congregation like family. Uh, early this morning, I received a call from a member within our church, uh, uh, the Decker family, and the passing of Mark Decker uh, in the middle of the night. If you know Mark Decker, he's always serving. He always has a Coke in his hand, and he loves his daughter, Kirsten, Kirsten, who is normally in the wheelchair here. And so very unexpected. And so as many of us uh, know him, we've had conversations of talking about watches or doing security uh, in the parking lot. Uh, I pray that we lift his family up in prayer. As I was there this morning, there was tons of questions, not enough answers. And that's okay. The Lord knows them all. And I believe that the Lord is going to give that family the comfort and peace. We are grateful that Mark knew Jesus. <laughs> And Mark now has a new body that he is now in heaven restoring with him. And so if we can, Pastor Scott, would you lead us uh, in prayer uh, for the family as well? Yeah, thanks, Pastor Tay. Uh, Pastor Tay, 445 this morning, called out to do that. Really appreciate his shepherd's heart for the people of God here. Saw Mark Tuesday night, National Night yeah, Out. Yeah. And boy, he was just, you can't talk two minutes to Mark without him being excited about his daughter, Kirsten, Ain't and the family true. and that. And so this is an opportunity, of course, a surprise. You never know that. Um, it's an opportunity for the church to be the best. Yes. To be the church. Let me just, as I pray over the, uh, the uh, Decker family, let me read to you from Romans chapter 12. These are short staccato commands, one after the other after the other, about how does church walk through valleys like this with a precious family. 
Rejoice with those who rejoice. Weep with those who weep. Live in harmony with one another. Do not be haughty. Associate with the lowly. Never be wise in your own sight. Repay no one evil for evil. Give thought to do what is honorable in the sight of all. If possible, so far as it depends on you, you live peaceably with all. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. It's, it's our time now to lean in. I don't know what to do. I don't know if I should lean in or not. I don't know. What should I say? Well, you don't have to say anything, but lean in. The card, the call, Pastor, take and direct. He'll give you information on, on services, things like that. But don't hold back. Now is not the time to wonder, should I hold back? Now is the time to lean in, provide comfort and care. Um, Barbara and Kirsten and the boys are going to need that kind of reassurance, just a, an arm around the shoulder, just to be there. The ministry of presence will go an awful long way. And so let's pray right now. Father, Lord, known the Decker family for decades. Pastor Tate said, thank you for their strong faith in you. Lord, in the face of some pretty difficult circumstances, with their precious daughter, Kirsten. Father, I thank you for the promise, the hope, the resurrection. We grieve, but not like those who have no hope. I pray even this morning, as Pastor Tate mentioned, all the questions, those are only going to grow in the coming days, that you would comfort and give encouragement to Barbara. Kirsten to the boys. Family travels in as Pastor Tay has a chance to speak hope of the resurrection at a funeral. Lord, I pray that we together as a church would pull around this family, take care of their needs. I thank you, Lord, for the years we had with Mark and Lord, the way he served in so many different ways. And I pray, Father, again, your comfort, your care, your provision and protection over that family. Thank you, Lord, for this congregation pulling together the heart and soul of a, a family, a family of faith, Lord, to encourage. Now, Father, are we uh, going to go on with the rest of the service, Lord? We're here. We're going to cover some announcements. We're going to sing. We're going to hear God's word preached. Lord, in all of those things, I pray that you would be honored. The hope of the gospel would sound forth. And Lord, thank you so much that the thing that we are mostly about, the good news of Jesus Christ, is the only thing that gives us hope and encouragement at a time like this. May the Deckers rest in that, I pray, in Jesus' strong name. And all God's people agreed by saying, amen. 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 Thank you, Pastor Kay, for pastoring, you. and I know you've got a few other things. Yeah, thanks, thanks. Yeah, and what a moment to, to lean in and see the people of God, as Scott said, rise up and love on each other. It, it's, you, you find Christ a little bit deeper in the moments of crisis and, and things, so... Well, good morning again. Glad you all are here. If you are new with us, you're like, man, this church really cares about their people. Yes, we do. And we want to care about you as well. So if you're new with us, meet us out in the atrium. We got a take five table there. We would love to say hello, get to know you. Maybe you have some questions about our church or our team here. We would love to answer, answer those questions for you as well as a gift uh, for you there. Uh, one of the things we are fired up about here at Gospel Life uh, is loving on our community and missions. And this week, those two got to wed together, and it was awesome in many ways. And so this week, uh, a lot of our team joined in what they call National Night Out. Uh, this is a thing around the globe where police officers love on their communities. They set up in the park, and it goes crazy. We got a chance to do that with the Carroll Stream Police uh, Department. You'll see a couple of pictures kind of scrolling through behind me. And uh, it was a great night. Our team took the band shell and had a good time playing around and doing some jams. And we had a booth just talking to people, really loving on them. And so thank you for all those who gave up your time to volunteer, to support, to even send some financial resources that way. It was a great event that even our community knows that this church is for real about advancing the gospel through its people. And then just yesterday, we had a, a kind of domestic mi uh, missions trip right here in our own backyard. You got to sleep in their own bed when they got home, use their own shower, eat their own food, and the people showed up. We partner with Sin Relief, which you'll hear a little bit more today. The president of Sin Relief is actually going to be our speaker today while he's in town. But we partner with Sin Relief, which is through North American Mission Board, which some of us know a lot about. They have what they call a serve tour, and we were pushing that for several weeks, an opportunity for us to be together as a church, to go on mission, and to help another church as they are remodeling the church building. This is a 100% Ghanaian church, and so they're trying to get in their building by uh, October. And so we went over and loved on them, did some painting, did some landscaping, did whatever they asked to try to get them in the building. So that was some of our team uh, there, and it was a great day to be the hands and feet of Jesus. The one thing Jesus said he was going to do, 
He was going to build his kingdom through the local church. And my goodness, he is doing it. And so we won't fear, we won't fret the schemes of the enemy because Christ said upon that rock he would build his church and the gates of hell would not prevail against it. Amen? Amen. And so we are grateful that you all, you sitting in these chairs, and thank you to the endless people who signed up to go uh, to be on, this, on, the, on our team yesterday. It was a fantastic opportunity, again, to serve the people. All right? Well, and then again, we can't do any of that. We can't have these partnerships. We can't have a, a, a mission mind, whether it's here or overseas, without the financial contributions. Or I would like to say the partnership. If you believe what God is doing here, you partner by sowing the seed, by giving a tithe and an offering and your time into the ministry. And so I am very grateful for that. And you go to work 40, 50, 60 hours a week, and then you, if you follow the command to give to the church. And the church uses those resources, not for our personal gain. Oh, no. If that was the case, I'll be driving to Bugatti instead of a 2011 Nissan. <laughs> but for the advancement of the kingdom in every place, whether it's Romeoville, whether it's Killstream, whether it's Accra, Ghana, everywhere for the kingdom of God. And we are grateful just to be a part of what God is doing here on earth. So let me pray for that. And then we're going to observe our time here in communion. Lord, thanks again for your love for us. Thank you for the heart of missions, people who get the excitement to see your kingdom come in new ways. Lord, I pray you continue to let us be conduits of your grace and mercy and love that others may come to know you. I pray that in Jesus' name. One of the things we do every week, uh, every first Sunday of the month, we take a moment to observe this holy table, uh, the moment where we talk about where Jesus sacrificed his body and his blood so that we may be forgiven, that we may have, have life. And he took on that final payment. There's no other atonement, if you want to use the word. There's no other sacrifice we have to give for the sake of our sins. Jesus, once and for all, finally completed that upon the cross. And so today, we want to observe that as his believers, as his, his children. And so as we do every week, I'm going to uh, ask us to stand in just a minute. And how it works for us, we're going to stand. We're going to exit the back rows. You're going to come down the center aisle. You're going to grab your elements. All of the bread here in these trays are gluten-free. We do have some of the packages as well. You're going to get your element, and would you just hold it until you get to your seat? Let me read a little bit here from 1 Corinthians 11, and I'm reading today from the CSB. Uh, version, just this command uh, uh, of the communion. 11.23, for I received from the Lord what is also passed on to you. And on the night when he was betrayed, the Lord took the bread and he broke it. And he given thanks and he said, this is my body which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same way, he took the cup after supper and said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For who also eat of this bread and drink of this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. What a powerful reminder that this, these holy, powerful symbols and sacraments was for you. That we may be free once and for all. And that someday when he calls us home, we'll rejoice and have the greatest meal with our Savior because you took that step to believe in him. And so one of the things here at Gospel Life, you do not have to be a member take communion with us. The only request is that you are saved and you have a relationship with Jesus. And if that's someone in the room today and you are not saved and don't know Jesus, I would love to have the conversation with you uh, after service to, so you can hear of that marvelous grace and mercy, all right? Let's do this together. Would you stand with me? If you're serving, why don't you come up front? Gish is on the crosses. Our band is going to sing under us. You can start from the back, come right down the center aisles, get your elements and hold them and we will partake of them together.
Friends, as you hold these elements in your hand, the two moments we do in communion is we remember and we celebrate. We remember the fact that that death on the cross bore us our freedom and the hope that we have forever. And we also celebrate the fact that those who know Jesus will do just as it said in Corinthians. We will proclaim his death until he comes. And what a moment where all of God's children will someday be together worshiping at his throne and so I'll pray over this bread. Pastor Scott will pray over the cup and we'll partake our elements together. Would you bow with me? Lord, again, thank you for the everlasting hope we have in Christ, our Savior, Jesus Christ. For there is no other name under heaven and earth, Lord, that saves. It's taken away the, the curse of our sin and the penalty of our sin. And who has washed us clean as a gift for those who believe. Lord, thank you for that sacrifice. As the scripture says, Lord, you sent your son who you loved down to this world that he would love us so that all who believes will not perish but have everlasting life. We remember that night when he was betrayed and beaten. He died and he bled, but he rose again victoriously with power in his hands. We are thankful for that victory over death, over the grave, over the schemes of the enemy, our victorious Christ has risen. Lord, we thank you for this time, and we partake of this in remembrance of him. Let us eat together. Father, once again, we pause before you. In gratitude, Lord, as Pastor Tay read, we give thanks. We also proclaim, Lord, these symbols remind us of this, the very heart of our faith. Thank you for the simplicity of the gospel. Not about what we do, but what about Jesus has done. We believe that. We remember that. Father, we also remember those who are serving as missionaries on the front lines. Thank you so much for our partnership, Lord. The privilege we have as a congregation of giving to support them, to pray for them, to communicate with them. Will you bless them, Lord, as they're serving frontline gospel ministry? Will you support them, keep them safe and strong, help them to know we are for them, that we share this worship experience together? Father, I pray for our brothers and sisters, Christians around the world who often are persecuted for their faith. 
discouraged or driven out of home or lost jobs or made fun of, Lord, will you give them strength and courage that their witness would be firm and strong. And as we sip and as we swallow, we'll remember we're part of a billion strong believers around the world, but we don't live to ourselves. So, Father, thank you for the reminder of that in this moment of worship we pray. And we ask this in Jesus' strong name. All God's people agreed by saying, amen. Let's drink this remembrance of Jesus. stand as we sing together.
and praise this morning for the blood that you shed on the cross, God. We thank you, Lord, for the ways that you are faithful to us in years past, in times present, Lord, and in the future. And we pray, Lord, that as we continue in worship now, that you'd go before us, God, would you speak to us, open our hearts, open our ears, that we might hear from you. We thank you, Jesus, for this time together. It's in your name that we pray. Amen. You may be seated. My kids are dismissed. All right, kids, you can be dismissed. You go right out these side doors here down to uh, uh, Children's Church. Miss Kayla, thank you for leading us. And you and Andrew, congratulations on an anniversary. That is awesome. How many years, may I ask? Six years. So you were like nine when you got married or something. So uh, one of the things you may know, you may recognize as a congregation, thank you for that, Bill. Um, we uh, try and model generosity, including 10% of all that we receive, we put, uh, put aside for missions. And uh, one of our missions partners, we have multiples, is uh, Send Network. Now, Send Network plants churches all around the United States. As a matter of fact, it's the uh, largest church planting organization in the United States or in North America. One of the other partners we have, Send Relief, which is a way that we can help serve when it comes to compassion ministries. And so this morning, it really is our privilege to have the president of both Send Relief preaching for us this morning. But what I love about uh, Pastor Bryant Wright is, uh, as we were talking about it, he said, listen, when you introduce me, let him know I'm a pastor, and so 38 years he uh, uh, planted, he founded, and he pastored Johnson's Ferry Baptist Church outside of Atlanta, Georgia, Marietta. Uh, he also has a media ministry right from the heart or straight from, is it right or straight from, I keep getting mixed right up. Right from the heart. Right from the heart ministries, and so I was uh, watching, uh, he was back at Johnson Ferry preaching back in early July, I watched that message, and listen, I love his heart for the next generation, as our church has, so he has a deep commitment to see the next generation of young men and women rise up and shake this world for the power of Jesus Christ. So, Pastor Wright, will you come up and preach to us? So glad to welcome. Let's give him a gospel life welcome. Thank you. God bless you. And uh, just, just like this is your home, all right? You just like you own the place, all right? All right, good. Thank you so much, Scott. And I want to thank you for the opportunity to be here, not only to share the Word of God, but represent Sin relief and urge you to listen carefully. I know you may struggle with my Manhattan accent that uh, is hard for you to follow, so listen carefully today. But let me just share a little bit about sin relief. Three and a half years ago, this did not exist, but three and a half years ago, in March of 2020, the very week that COVID shut down the whole world, sin relief began. And to give you a little background, we're all about meeting needs and seeing God change lives. And the mission of sin relief is to serve churches like yours. As you're seeking to carry out the great commission of carrying the gospel to the whole world through ministries of compassion, because we believe that ministries of compassion both show the love of Christ and open doors for sharing the gospel of Christ. We have five major areas we focus in. One is strengthening communities. And this very weekend has been the Serve Tour in Chicagoland. Seventy-six churches came together with service projects all over this metro area this weekend, and working with local churches here in Chicago with those service projects so that when all these teams of volunteers have come in and gone, these churches in these communities have better won the right to be heard in sharing the good news of Christ. A big part of strengthening communities is global hunger relief in third world nations, building wells in third world nations where there's no clean water, all kind of projects to open doors like that. Secondly, is ministry to refugees. And the largest undertaking that we have done in ministry in our first three and a half years is ministry to Ukrainian refugees. Over 7 million Ukrainian refugees, overwhelmingly women and children, because the men are staying to defend their land, and the needs have been overwhelming. And we work through churches, Eastern European churches, right there on the border of Ukraine, as these Refugees have come across are providing all kinds of food, health hygiene supplies, different needs that are there in order to share the good news of Jesus Christ. Thirdly is ministry to children and families. And we're very thankful that the Supreme Court overruled Roe versus Wade in a way that's going to save hundreds of thousands of lives. Amen. But understand this. Now the church 
has to decide if we're going to step up to the plate. Because what happened in the past with hundreds of thousands of unwanted lives in the womb are now going to be hundreds of thousands of unwanted lives outside the womb. And the need in foster care and adoption is going to skyrocket in the days ahead. And is the church going to step up to the plate and show the love of Christ to these children in need of families and homes? And Sin Relief does all kind of training assistance to help churches begin to have ministries in this area. Third is, fourth is battling human trafficking, probably the most heinous evil in our world today and rescuing as many of these young children, mostly young girls, that get trapped in a modern form of slavery today that is just so detestable to God. And fourth is assisting disaster relief teams. Our convention of churches, like the Illinois Convention, has a disaster relief volunteer team. And when tornadoes, hurricanes, floods occur, they go in to help. And Sin Relief has a huge warehouse in Kentucky. We send our trucks out with all kind of food supplies, roofing materials, whatever is needed with these disaster relief teams to go in after a crisis and share the love of Christ in a very real way. But I hope you'll hear this. I have a nightmare that one day Sin Relief can become just another humanitarian organization we are not. You see, I remind our staff that we can care and minister to hurting people on their journey to hell and miss the greatest need in their life, and that is salvation in Jesus Christ that comes through the gospel. We are most of all a gospel ministry that is seeking to live out the great commandment of Jesus in a way that churches can better fulfill his great commission. And what's so exciting with Sin Relief all of us, I'm a part of the International Mission Board staff. Many of our staff are part of the North American Mission Board staff. But all of us, because our personnel costs, our operating costs are covered out of the mission organizations of the International Mission Board and North American Mission Board, 100% of gifts to Sin Relief go to actual ministry. There are not many ministries can make a statement like that. And that is a huge area of excitement for what we've begun in our convention of churches. So... Thank you for your support, and you may want to volunteer or find out more about Sin Relief. Just go to our website at sinrelief.org and find out how you can participate in this very exciting new ministry. But I know you're not here today to hear about Sin Relief. You're here to hear a word from God. And in light of Pastor Scott's series, Blueprint, dealing with the key doctrines of our faith, today we're going to look at doctrine number two, that really f flows perfectly out of, what, out of what he's already covered with you on the creation. Today, we deal with the question, is God really three persons, the Trinity? This is vitally important. So let me ask you to turn in your Bibles, if you will, to Genesis chapter 1. If you're new to Bible study, this will be easy to find. Page 1, <laughs> Genesis 1. And we're going to introduce this study by looking at verses 1 through 3. We'll come down to verses 26 and 27 in just a minute. But I think it's always good to show our respect and honor of God, our Creator, to stand for the reading of His Word. So if you're physically able, would you stand now as we look at Genesis 1, verse 1. In the beginning, God. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And the earth was formless and void, and darkness was over the surface of the deep, and the Spirit of God was moving over the surface of the waters. Then God said, let there be light, and there was light. Father, Jesus, Holy Spirit our one God, that we have the privilege of praying to now. May you speak to us. May you speak to our minds and our hearts and our wills to better understand you, our Creator, as Father, as Son, and Holy Spirit. And Holy Spirit, may you make it clear in the study of your Word that Jesus Christ is central to the old and new covenant in the ultimate revelation of who God 
really is. For we pray this, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. A long time to stand through the sermon. My wife, Ann, and I have the privilege of having three grown sons, seven grandchildren, the oldest grandchild, a college student at Auburn, the youngest is four years old, a wide age man there. And my three sons know me as their father. They know me one way. But I'm also the son of my two parents who are in heaven now, great folks. And they knew me one way as well, different from how my sons know me. But also, for 38 years, I was the pastor of a church in North Atlanta, and the folks in that church, they knew me one way as their pastor. It was different from how my sons know me or how my parents knew me, but I'm the same person. Now, some of you are sitting there saying, that's a pretty good analogy of the Trinity, but it is totally inadequate. <laughs> and it's totally inadequate because how do you explain Jesus the Son Praying to God the Father. Jesus, God, praying to God the Father. How do you explain that? Now that's when the Trinity begins to be incomprehensible to the finite human mind. So today we want to see what God's Word reveals from the very beginning of Scripture to show us who He is and the best way we can praise Him and know Him as Father Son, and Holy Spirit. Now look at Genesis 1.1. In the beginning God. Now understand this. That is a radically countercultural statement in the culture in which we live. Because the majority opinion in the culture in which we live is that evolution explains all of this. And all of this that we see in our world, it happened by chance. That is the dominant scientific and cultural view. So right from the beginning... Scripture says, in the beginning, God. That is radically countercultural. And it's not that Scripture is making an argument for God. It just makes a statement about God. In the beginning, God. Now think about this for a second. Our finite human mind can maybe understand how something can last forever. But how do you explain something that never begins? And always is. That is incomprehensible. For from the first few words of Scripture, God tells us about Himself that He always is, was, and will be. In the beginning, God is there. And God has created the heavens and the earth. Now, to think about the greatness of God, let's think about our heavens for a second. Scientists tell us or estimate that there are perhaps 300 sextillion stars. Now, sextillion is a number that's so beyond me, it boggles my mind. It's basically 23 zeros after the three. But maybe that's too big a number to even get your brain around. So let me explain it in a smaller way. One galaxy, the Milky Way, our galaxy, one of hundreds of thousands of galaxies, is a hundred thousand light years across just our one galaxy now I don't know about you but that means we have got an incredibly powerful and big God so let's bring it down to even smaller our earth just small little ball it's only about 25,000 miles in circumference around the earth my wife and I were seeing some of our sin relief ministry centers in uh, Manila, Bangkok, and Nairobi back in May, we went completely around the world. First time we've ever done something like that. And when we got home, we figured up all the mileage of our flights. It was 24,736 miles. We were about 200 miles short of completely going around the world. And it just, seemed, it just boggled our mind to do something like that. But that's just one little planet in this vast, vast creation of God. It's interesting that in Psalm 19.1, let me read to you this verse in Psalm 19.1. God's Word says, the heavens tell the glory of God, and their expanse declares the work of His hands. In other words, the heavens show us the greatness of God, but here on earth we also see the greatness of what God has created as well. But here's something else that's very interesting. The word for God in the Hebrew in Genesis 1 is the Hebrew word Elohim. Now I realize 
Most of you on the pews, you could care less about Greek and Hebrew translations, but this is really pretty cool. The Hebrew word for God means the living God and the plurality, the plurality of God. That's what it means, the word Elohim. So in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Well, to know this God, Jesus tells us that when we pray in his great sermon, the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 6, 9, he says, when you pray, say, our Father. Now, the word for Father is the word Dad, Abba, Dad. A very personal God. This God who has created all the heavens that we just described and all the earth, we can know personally as our Father. So many of you have been so disillusioned by your fathers. We live in a culture of absentee fathers, of fathers that are remote and removed, of fathers that disappoint and disillusion. But in God, we have the perfect Father who is perfect love, perfect compassion, perfect responsibility and dependability who is strong and compassionate, the perfect Father. We see that in God, and Jesus teaches us that is how we pray to our God, who is Father. But second verse, look at verse number two. The earth was formless and void. In other words, it didn't exist. And darkness was over the surface of the deep, speaking of the waters, and the Spirit of God was moving over the surface of the waters. Now, there was nothing and what is so amazing about the creative power of God is He creates out of nothing. But now we see the Holy Spirit, the third person of our trying God, our one God, is mentioned here. The Spirit is moving over the first aspect of creation, which is the waters. And the Spirit is moving. It gives us a picture like the wind. Do you realize in the Old and New Covenant that the wind and the Holy Spirit are commonly compared? You look at Exodus chapter 14 when God parted the waters of the Red Sea so the children of Israel could be set free and leave slavery in Egypt. It's talk, it talks about the great wind. The Spirit of God moved in the winds. When you see Jesus speaking with a great Bible scholar who was lost as can be but believed the Bible, Nicodemus, he said, Nick, man, it's like the wind. The Spirit is like the wind. You can't see it. You see evidence of it. You know it exists, the wind. You see where you feel it on your face. You see the leaves falling. But if I were to ask you today, have any of you ever seen the wind? I know some fool would probably hold up his hand and say, yes, I've seen the wind. No, you hadn't seen the wind, bless your heart. You, you've, you've seen evidence of the wind. You've seen the leaves blowing, the dust in the air. But you had not seen the wind. Nobody knows where it is. We can't see it. Well, the Spirit is like that. It's like the wind. And then at Pentecost... When the disciples had that intense 10-day prayer meeting after Jesus had ascended to heaven 40 days after his resurrection, it says in Acts 2, 1 and 2, that the Spirit came upon them like the wind, a mighty wind. And so we see this here. Right here in the second verse of the Bible, the Holy Spirit is in this creative work. Now think about man is like God in that we have creative powers, incredible creative powers, but not like the Creator God who creates out of nothing. We take the matter that God has created, and we create amazing things. But God creates out of nothing. At first there was nothing, then He created the waters, then the wind begins to move over the waters and take part in this creative process of creation. A few years ago, my wife and I were in Florence, Italy. We saw that incredible statue that Michelangelo did of David. You realize in 1501, when he was commissioned to do that statue, he was just 26 years old. And it says of Michelangelo, the historians tell us that day after day, looking at that huge block of marble that nobody could do anything with, he would come out and just stare at that block of marble. Didn't do anything, he just stared at it. And when the statue was done, people asked him about it. Why did you just come out and stare every day? He says, I was looking to release David from that block of marble. That's, a, that's an artist there. That's a master artist. But you know, the statue of David in Florence, it, he doesn't speak. He doesn't have a heart. He's not alive. God creates life out of nothing. He is the ultimate master artist, and the Holy Spirit has a part in that in verse 2. Let's go to verse 3. Then God said, let there be light, and there was light. Now, this is the Word of God. This is the Word of God in the creative process. The Word speaks. Out of nothing comes God's creation. Here, the Word speaks. Who is the Word? Well, in John 1, 1, verses 1 through 3, it's very clear. 
in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God. The Word was God. The Word is Jesus. This is Jesus. Don't make the mistake of thinking that Jesus began in the womb of Mary. Jesus took on flesh in the womb of Mary, but Jesus always is, was, and will be. What is different is his nature is different when he takes on flesh and enters the womb of Mary to be a human being like us while being fully God at the same time. But here is Jesus, the Word. Jesus, the Word, speaks and says, let there be light, and there was light. Question, question. How in the world could there be light if it wasn't until the fourth day of creation that the sun and the moon and the stars were created? Where are you going to get that light? Well, the light is Jesus. Jesus is not only light in the sense of enlightenment, in the ultimate revelation of God and who He is, but Jesus is actual light. In John 8, 12, Jesus says, I'm the light of the world. But let me read to you another verse in Revelation 22, 5. This is after Jesus has come again. This is after the end of the earth and the heavens as we know it. This is the new heaven, the new Jerusalem. And this is what it says in Revelation 22, 5, the last chapter of the Bible. And there will no longer be any night. And they will not have need of the light of a lamp, nor the light of the sun, because the Lord God will illuminate them, and they will reign forever and ever. Speaking of the church, we get to reign with Jesus in the eternal splendor, supernal splendor of His kingdom in the new Jerusalem. There's no need for sun. There's no need for these lights the light of Jesus. There'll be no night because the light, actual light of Jesus. So in verse 3, we see that right there before the sun and the moon and the stars. Let there be light. That is Jesus, the light of the world. God is Father in verse 1. God is Spirit in verse 2. God is Jesus, the Son in verse 3. You see, the Trinity is right from the beginning of Scripture. A lot of people think that's just taught in the New Testament. No, right from the beginning of Scripture. You may have Jewish friends that say you people believe in three gods. No, we don't believe in three gods. We believe in one God and three persons. Well, that's just a New Testament idea. It's not in the Scriptures. Go to page 1, verse 1, verse 2, verse 3. Right there in the beginning of the Hebrew Scriptures, we see God as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And lest you miss that, let's go to verse 26 of Genesis 1. Then God said, Look at this now. Listen, are you listening? Let us make man in our image according to our likeness. And let them rule over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the sky and over the cattle and over all the earth and over every created thing that creeps on the earth. God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him male and female. He created them. Now, Understand this about this passage. We see the Hebrew word for God, Elohim, which means the living God and the plurality of God, and now being expressed as let us. Some say, well, that's just the angels. Look, we're not created in the image of angels. We are created in the image of God. Let us make man in our image. That is God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. Right there in the beginning of the creative process. Now, question. What does it mean to be made in the image of God? That means to be in the likeness of God. In other words, we are not God. We are in no way close to the incomparable greatness of God. But we are like God. How are we like God? We are like God in that we can think and reason. We are like God in that we can create. We talked about Michelangelo, incredible creative master artist. We can create like God, but not as great as God who creates out of nothing. It's also an understanding that man likes communication. God is the Word, the ultimate communicator. And we communicate like God. But we also know that man is a moral being. Now, I've heard a lot of people in the church, maybe some of you have made this statement where you say, you know, in America today, People have no morals today. They don't care about any morals. Bless your heart, that's the most ignorant statement you could ever make. I mean, I I don't don't mean to offend you in making such a dumb statement, but the fact is all, all men and women everywhere care about morality. 
it may not be your morality, it may not be God's morality, but if you don't believe it, just look how the ideology of wokeness and political correctness today, if you don't believe they're passionate about values, you don't have your eyes open. They're passionate about moral values. And if you don't believe it, just ignore one of their moral boundaries and see the shame and the way you'll be cut out of culture today. Because man has a moral conscience. The question is, will that moral conscience be God's morality, or will it be what you feel is best in your own eyes? You see, man is like God in all these ways, but one other way. Man is relational. And God speaks in his creation of male and female. Men and women equal before God. Now, in the body of Christ... As taught in the scriptures, there will be differing roles where the man is to be the leader in the home, where the man is to be the elders in the church, but men and women are equal before God and have equal responsibility before God in using the gifts and ability God has given you for the glory of God. We are male and female in the image of God. And the ultimate relationship that God has invented is the marriage relationship where one man and one woman are to come together in commitment of love for life. And yet, all kind of disharmony has resulted. And so much of the disillusionment of this world has to do with brokenness in human relationships. Many of you are experiencing that now or have experienced that in the past. All kind of brokenness. You see, in the Trinity, now listen, are you listening? Don't miss this. In the Trinity, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit is the perfect, harmonious relationship. Complete oneness. No dissension. One of the misguided notions that's in liberal theology in the churches in America today, a lot of Protestant churches in America today is, People say in their new morality, they say embracing the sexual revolution, that this is just an enlightened spirit of God guiding us. Don't kid yourself. The Holy Spirit never leads us to do something contrary to the Word of God. The Holy Spirit convicts us that the Word of God is truth in revealing to us ultimate truth in Jesus. But don't make the confused mindset of saying the Spirit has enlightened us with a new understanding when it's complete opposite of the Word of God. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, complete harmony, complete oneness. And we need to know that because we live in a world of brokenness because of our sin. Now, we don't have time to go into the study today of Genesis 3, but just the third chapter. The third chapter gives us understanding why the problems of the world exist. When Adam and Eve sinned, then we all inherited their sin nature. And not only did they sin, but we all choose to sin. And the bad news that is found in the Word of God is that our sin separates us from God. And if we don't find a solution to our sin problem, we're going to spend eternity separated from God. That is not good. That is not good. But the good news that is found in Scripture is that God the Father sent God the Son, and God the Son, Jesus, literally voluntarily surrendered to his Father's will, and he came not most of all to show us what God is like, not most of all to show us how God wants us to live, but most of all to save us. He came to give his life for us. You just observed the Lord's Supper the essence of our faith, to remember what is most important in our faith, that the God of the universe who has created this hundreds of sextillions of stars is a God that personally loves you so much that even when we turn our back on God, even when we do what we think is right when it comes to religion and philosophy and morality and get so messed up, this God sent his son who left his throne in heaven to humble himself to become a man to give his life for us and pay the penalty of our sin on the cross, which is death. Because if you think you're going to get to heaven by good works, well, good luck. 
because God is very clear. You've got to be perfect. Now, if I ask you to raise your hand if you've never sinned in here, uh, once again, some fool might raise their hand, bless their heart. But the fact is, we all sin. We all fall short. We all fall short, every one of us. And we're desperately in need of a Savior. We can never make ourselves perfect. So Jesus gave his life for us on the cross. And not only that, when you and I come to confess our sin and acknowledge our sinfulness of choosing to do things our way rather than God's way, and believe that Jesus paid our penalty on the cross, God forgives us. And he makes us right with him. Not because we deserve to be, but because of what he has done for us on the cross. But the good news gets even better. He conquered sin and death through his resurrection. So that when you and I come to trust him, our physical bodies will give out one day, but our soul lives on with the Lord. And one day, shortly before Jesus' second coming, he's going to come for his church again, and he's going to give us new resurrected bodies that are like his, that never get sick, that never get wrinkled, that never have the sags of old age, but a new body Amen. that never gets dead. And it's going to be glorious. And you don't want to miss out on that great gift. But it gets even better. When we come to trust Christ and give our heart and life to Christ, we're not only forgiven of sin and made right with God, we not only receive the gift of victory over death, but we receive God the Holy Spirit in our hearts and lives. Because you see, we're so sinful and so selfish, we, we can't live the life that God has designed for us that is the best kind of life, the most meaningful life, the most fulfilling life. But with the Holy Spirit, we're empowered with an inner want to, to trust Christ and to follow His Word, knowing that He has created us and knows how life works best. It's a beautiful thing. God the Father, the perfect Father, not a father that disappoints and disillusions, a loving father, a strong father, a responsible father, a dependable father, but also Jesus' son. It shows us the incredible love of God, the ultimate sacrifice he has made so that you and I can be in right relationship with our heavenly father. And then empowered by the Holy Spirit to follow Christ. And in the process, the Holy Spirit entered the church at Pentecost. And the Holy Spirit enters the life of anyone who comes to trusting faith in Christ. And the Holy Spirit empowers us not only to follow Jesus, but to fulfill his mission of taking the good news of the gospel to every person on the face of the earth. I shared with you a little early about the Ukrainian refugees being the largest ministry sin relief is undertaken. Let me just tell you about one human story. We ministered to hundreds of thousands of those refugees. But Natasha came to one of those churches that was receiving all these resources to help them through a desperate time in that awful war in Ukraine. She was Orthodox, so she knew of God. She knew of Jesus. She had been in a church occasionally on a funeral or a wedding. But she didn't really know Jesus. But by seeing the love of the body of Christ there that was ministering to her in a time when she had lost everything, she wanted to have what those people had. And she came to personally trust Christ as her Lord and Savior and began that personal relationship with the Lord like many of you. You see, the Holy Spirit empowers us, the church, to carry out the mission of God, the Son, Jesus, so that we can personally live forever with God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. Is our God three persons in one? Absolutely. But because it is almost indescribable in human terms, it fills the sense of majesty and awesomeness of Almighty God, who is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. May we worship Him. May we believe in Him. May we follow Him. Let's pray. 
Father God, thank you for loving us so much to send us God the Son, Jesus, to save us from our sins. And for those of us who have responded with the decision of faith to trust Christ as our Savior and Lord, thank you for giving us God the Holy Spirit to dwell within us, to seal our faith as you describe to empower us and give us that inner want to keep trusting you through Christ to follow you and to fulfill the mission for your church. Oh, Father, thank you for how awesome you are. Father, if there are individuals here today that don't really know you personally, but perhaps the Holy Spirit through the preaching of the Word has just helped them to realize this is truth. I can't quite understand it, but I know this is the ultimate truth, and I'm going to choose to believe it. May this be the day, the turning point in that person's life. They stop believing that they're going to live in the way they feel is best and desire now to follow Jesus and live in a way that you teach us in your word. Oh, Lord, may it be. We pray this prayer in Jesus' name. stand as we close and pray this song together.
is Father, Son, and Spirit. You heard your children. You hear your children. yesterday, today, and forever. Lord, we thank you that you created the earth and everything in it, God, and that we get to observe that. We get to worship you. And so now as we go from this place, Lord, we pray that we might go in your spirit. We might walk in faith um, and we might proclaim your name in this way. And it's in your name that we pray all these things. Amen. Amen. Happy Sunday. Have a great week. We'll see you next week.